Okay, we're at the end of the session here with Snoopy, and uh, he's a really great dog. He was rescued, uh, a really a former street dog of LA, and as a result, he has some bad habits and behaviors that the guardians aren't a big fan of. Uh, but really, there's nothing that I saw here in the session that can't be remedied. Now, uh, I think the part of the reason why he was misacting out so much is really a lot of it is the same thing I ask all my clients is, when your dog misbehaves, have you taught your dog how you want it to behave in that situation? And if we haven't, and that's really our responsibility and not the dog's. And so basically what we wanted to do is we want to teach the dog how to behave in different situations. And that's a lot of what I did during this session. I refer to this a lot as light switch on, light switch off. If I'm petting the dog and then he likes it so much he jumps up on me and I continue to pet him, I'm rewarding him for jumping up on me. Remember, everything your dog is doing, or excuse me, anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're amplifying and reinforcing. So each time that you, your dog jumps up on you and you pet it, you're telling the dog, when you jump up on me, that's a great way to get me to pet you. Now we have two little ones in the house, and one of the little one's friends doesn't want to come over because he jumps up so much, and he's so excited, he sometimes bites at their hair. Now he's not doing it aggressively, but just like us, when we're out of balance, we're not going to be uh, give the best answers or perform optimally. Um, every TV show, uh, you know, anything that you see with a lawyer on TV, uh, the lawyer tries to get the guy on the witness stand, and he badgers him with a bunch of questions, tries to get him flustered and then springs the big question on him and gets him to admit something. When we are out of balance, that's the worst time for us to try to do anything. We want to take a walk, cool down, and let ourselves relax. So I think for him, he's a smaller dog and he was very under-exercised. He was getting about a 10 minute walk a day. And uh, I would say your average dog, especially a year, year and a half age that he is, needs at least an hour's exercise every day. And so uh, now exercising your dog is not gonna uh, fix your dog problems, but it's going to make fixing your dog problems much easier. So one of the first things I recommend the guardians do would be start an exercise journal. Just get a regular uh, you know, spiral notebook. Every time that uh, the dog, you exercise the dog, write down the time, what you did, and the quantity or the iteration. It's okay, buddy. Hang in there. Um, so uh, if I take him for a walk, I write down uh, 6.50 a.m., took him for a walk 15 minutes or whatever, 30 minutes, whatever it is. And then the next time I take him out, maybe we play fetch which is something hopefully I can get a chance to go over. Um, when the, uh, and when I play fetch, I count the number of fetches. And then, uh, now sometimes he will attack ankles. Not in a vicious way, I think he's just, a lot of times uh, some of the uh, pe people in the house wear uh, like, uh, jeans that are ripped up a little bit. So there's some, sorry buddy. So there are some uh, tassels hanging down. And a lot of times the dogs, like, that's attractive the dogs, they want to chase him and bite him. And so then he gets a little confused and he starts biting ankles. And again, he's just doing it playful or react, uh, not, not aggressive, but it's something he's, he's getting conditioned to do. So basically, um, uh, uh, every time that he does something like that or has an outburst and jumps up on the kids, we should interpret that as his way of saying, I have too much energy. Now we work out, I work out, I do high interval training, kind of trying to lose weight. Well, I do a half an hour workout once a day, and that's good for me for the rest of the day. Dogs are supreme athletes. They need exercise sprinkled throughout the day. So when the dog attacks the ankles or jumps on the kids or whatever, I want the humans in the house to interpret that as the dog's way of saying, I need some exercise, and to take him outside and play fetch. Um, so now, uh, for the, and I'm gonna talk about fetch here in a sec, but for the exercise journal, you saw right down the time that he attacked the ankles or jumped up on the kids or barked at the squirrel, or not barked at the squirrel, but as an excessive uh, outburst. And then at the end of the day, write down the times that you feed him as well, as well as when the accidents are in the house, if he has any. And at the end of the day, assign the dog a letter grade, A through F. Maybe he gets a, a C minus. The next day, maybe fetch him a couple more repetitions or add in an extra walk or an extra game of fetch. Uh, exercise should be sprinkled throughout the day, not just one big one in the morning. Um, and the idea for this, the exercise journal, at the end of the day, we give it a letter grade, so then we, and then we play with the elements until we find a day where he got an A plus behavior. Okay, now we know what exercise, the amount of exercise he needs to, uh, to succeed. Now we can also do things to put a dog in a position to succeed. If we're gonna have, uh, let's say one of the daughter is gonna have some of her friends come over the house, well we could take him out for a, lot, a couple of long walks or hire a dog walker to come by and walk him uh, for like an hour walk before they get home. Uh, before, the, before her friends arrive. Now we've depleted that excess energy. Dog's like, hey, I'll jump up on you, but I'm a little too, uh, too tired right now. I have to take a nap. Yes, you're gonna have to lick your tuchus a little bit later on. I'm probably not saying that right. Um, okay, now, um, uh, so the exercise journal will help keep that for about a month and uh, keep on doing it and playing around with the elements, like I said, until you get to the point, oh, you're gonna stay here, buddy. I don't know where you're gonna go and your guardians are in a meeting. That's why I'm doing this solo. 
Um, so, well, blowing a dog's nose sometimes will get a little, uh, to look at you. Now, the guard, uh, the, one of the kids likes uh, kisses. So I use passive training. Um, I'm going to talk about fetch in a sec. But for passive training, so when he kisses me, I can say kisses. Say the command word. Yes, I know. Say the command word after the dog does whatever the thing is that you want him to do. And after a while, you can create a command where you can say kisses and he'll give you licks or uh, whatever it is. And I'm going to talk about passive training here in a sec. Um, okay, now for the fetch. The guardians, uh, what a lot of people do is they just try to take the item away from the dog. And that makes the item a high value item. So one of the first things we want to do is teach the dog how to drop things on command. Now, in order to teach a dog to drop, what you want to do is wait for the dog to have a low value item. One of his toys that he is allowed to have in his though is on to have at any point, and he has it in his mouth. Not holding it here, chewing on it, but has it in his mouth. I pull out a treat, I know, and I'm seeing a little bit more of the rambunctious side because he wants to get down. So I hold it here, and he'll just try to take it while he keeps the ball or whatever it is in his mouth. As soon as he drops it and spits it out, I pop the treat in the dog's mouth, and I say the word drop. And then I do not pick up the item. So what we're teaching the dog is if the human asks you to drop something in your mouth and you drop it, they give you a delicious treat and then you get your stuff back 99% of the time. So that's a pretty good deal. The dog will continue to start dropping and we want to drop with the lowest value items first. Toys that he's allowed to have at any point. When he has a shoe, he knows he's not allowed to have that, not allowed to have that and he wants us to chase him. So if it's hard for him to give it up and every time we pull something away from it, we're going to make him guard it more often, more, uh, more strenuously. So what we're going to do instead is, is practice with low value items and just pull a treat out anytime he has a ball in his mouth, hold it up, drops it, put it in his mouth, say drop, and let him have the item. Later on, when he has a shoe or some, something he's not allowed to have, and you say drop it, spit that sucker out, and what did you get that treat? You've conditioned your dog to drop on command. Now, first you have to teach your dog to drop in order to teach it to fetch. Once he knows how to fetch, and he does like to fetch, he just doesn't like to drop the ball, I believe, from talking to the guardians earlier. So when I have dogs that do this, a lot of people, they chase the dog, well, that's fun for the dog. And then you're training the dog to come and chase uh, to the dog instead of bringing the ball back to you. So what you want to do is have high-value training treats, with throw the ball. Now, I say fetch three times. As I throw the ball, I say fetch when it leaves my hand. When the dog walks over and picks it up with its mouth, I say fetch a second time. And then when the dog comes over to me, I have a high-value training treat, and if the dog doesn't come to you, Hold your head out flat like this with the treat in it and slightly cupped, and then start lowering it. The lower you go, the more to the dog can go all the way to the grass if you have to, only when the dog's looking at you, though. Eventually, the dog will come to you. When it does, I, to make a dog sit, I go over their head in an arc. As soon as they sit, I lower the treat and I let them lick it off, and then I like to tickle them under the chin like this. Eventually, we're not always going to give them a treat, so this way we get them accustomed to getting at least that. So he's not listening to you, not coming to you. Hold out your hand like this and start lowering it and, and go all the way to the floor if you have to while he's looking at you. The lower you go, the more appealing it gets to the dog and they'll come to you. So the idea is when, when he gets it have, it, have your hand like this with a treat in it. Don't fool him. And when he comes over to you, lower it. And then I, I, I would roll over and change it. So I'd start off like this, lowering it. When he comes to me, I would hold it like this and hold it in front of his nose. And, and this time we're not going to say drop. We're going to wait for him to drop on his own. When he drops it, then I'm going to pop in his mouth and I'm going to say the word fetch. So now we're associating fetch with the three elements. When the ball gets thrown, I hear fetch. When I pick it up, I hear fetch. When I bring it and drop it, I get my final reward and I hear the word fetch. After a while, the dog will start bringing the ball to you, spitting at your feet, and waiting for you to throw it. Now, I'm a big proponent of helping the dog develop uh, 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 the ability, uh, well, self-control, really uh, through uh, our actions and through delayed gratification. So once he's fetching really well for you, then he brings you the ball, then tell, uh, and then uh, he spits it out, pick it up, tell him to sit. Only after he sits, throw it. And then after a while, he'll come and bring the ball, spit it out, and sit in front of you. Then you can elongate that and pick it up and say, and, and just wait a second or two seconds, then throw it. Next time, maybe wait three seconds. Don't necessarily go one, two, three each time, but keep on elongating it until he just sits there and he's really hyper. You wait for him to settle down. What you're telling him is, look, when you're hyper, I'm not going to throw the ball. When you're calm and balanced and you can think clearly, then I'll throw the ball for you. And if your timing is precise, throwing it as soon as he sits down or as soon as he's calm, then the dog starts to figure out, so when I sit, then he throws the ball. So then he comes and starts sitting faster. This is a great way because you're helping, a uh, great right way to be, be, uh, teach the dog because you're helping the dog discover these things on its own. You're not telling it what to do. You're providing a structured scenario. And when the dog does the thing you want, it gets a reward. And after a while, the dog figures this out because the dog's going through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for the dog to know what it is you're talking about. 
and, so, and it has to be repeated over and over with good timing. Most of us are really inconsistent. We don't have any rules, so we can't be consistent. We can't have good timing because there's no rules. And that just confuses the dog into thinking it's in charge of us. And I'm pretty sure that's a little bit of his situation here. He climbs on top of the furniture. He, uh, he just really didn't have any rules, so he didn't look at anything as being off limits. Well, the more that we enforce rules, the more we act like a leader, at least from the dog's perspective. So some of the rules we went over, we're breaking one right now, not being allowed on the furniture. For dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. So if we let the dog sit at the same height, that's one of the ways we say we're equals. If we're equals, then listening to us is optional. So what I would do instead is take the furniture away and say the dog's not allowed to be on the furniture for 30 days minimum or as long as the problem's still going on. Now we have a couch in the other room that he likes to hang out in. There's a bedding and all that fun stuff. I mentioned the guardians that might want to get X pads. Dogs also do not like tinfoil. And so we want to, or maybe take, get rid of that chip couch or chair completely. Now I also showed the guardians how to teach a dog to go to a dog bed on command. I would have a dog bed in every room and train him to go to it the same way I showed you here give each dog bed its own unique uh, uh, designation. So I can say Venice, which is the dog bed in the living room. Maybe the one over here is called Palisades. And so I can say Palisades, the dog runs over there expecting to get a reward that I showed the guardians off camera to get that reward for going to Palisades. I would also uh, do the same thing for uh, the cage or the kennel. Um, one of the guardians likes, I uh, have daughters, uh, likes to uh, program, I don't know the name of the program because I've not, uh, a seven-year-old girl, but they call in the program where the pony goes to the barn, which is pretty obvious. And so we can teach the dog the same method that I showed with the dog bed, just toss a treat in there when the dog goes in the kennel and gets it, say the word barn. So now we create an association the dog wants to go in the barn because that's where treats fall from the sky. Um, all right, um, and so, so get some dog beds, get them on Groupon, uh, get a Sealy Posturepedic one or the Memory Foam one, make sure they're square, no pattern. We want a, a white color, a light cream, or a very light gray. Dog's eyes are not very good for detail, and they're colorblind, so if we put too much pattern on it, he might not be able to see the treat that's waiting there for him. Okay, now some of the rules we went over, uh, besides not being on the furniture, well, let me finish the furniture one, I guess. So not being on the furniture for 30 days as long as the problem's still going on, and then furniture with an invitation and only for good behavior. This is a privilege. So the dog's invited up here by a human. It's a one-time pass. And if the dog starts barking, it has to get down. Or if it gets invited up here and then goes get a drink of water, when it comes back, we need another invitation to get back up on the couch. So the humans are controlling the resource. And the dog sees a literal distinction between the humans up here and the dog down there. Um, uh, let me see, uh, and, uh, another rule that we have is I make the dog sit before I let it in or out of the door. I go to the door and I say sit one time. If the, dog, the more you say it, the less you want. So get out of the habit of repeating the same command word over and over. I know, buddy, this is not the most fun, but I promise I'll let you go in a sec. So say, go to the door and say sit once and say it as a command. And then count to yourself in your brain, one, two, three. If he doesn't sit by the time you hit three, walk away. And then wait for him to sit down again, uh, or wait for one minute, excuse me. Then go to the door and tell him, sit. And if he doesn't sit this time within uh, three seconds, I walk away this time for two minutes. Then the next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes. I'm gonna keep on doubling the length of time until when I go to the door and say sit, he sits down. As soon as he sits down, I open the door and let him out like there's a remote control in his butt. After a while, he'll go sit at the door as his way of indicating I would like to go outside. Now, he also pees all over the place. Uh, inside, outside, down on the grass. I'm gonna hopefully remember to put a link to a video uh, that I did with another dog about remedial potty training and how to teach your dog to go to a specific part of the yard to potty. If I forget to do that, make sure you just message me. I can add it in the text by the time you're watching this. If you're not the clients, it should be linked in the text somewhere on Dog on Problems on this uh, session to write up. Uh, the first thing you need to do is assign a command word. They haven't assigned a command name. And make sure that the guardians, uh, one of the things I like the guardians to do is make a list of the command words. Most of us use a lot of versions of words for dogs, which makes it harder for them to understand. If you speak English, come, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, whistle, tap my thigh, and a nickname all mean come to me in our mind because we speak English. But to a dog, those are each distinct and unique command words that have to be memorized. And the more words he has to remember, the harder it is for him. It's much easier for all of us just to use one word. So go up to the list of command words and write down, and try to come up with fun command words. He really doesn't have any skills. It's hard for a dog to have self-esteem if he doesn't have any skills. I like the guardians to go to YouTube, and if they don't want to go to YouTube, just message me. I can send you videos on how to teach your dog to sit, and lay down, or whatever. I went through passive training with them, and I'm going to show you a little trick on how you can pet your dog here in a sec uh, to train it just by petting it at the right time. Uh, but uh, come up with funny command words. Now you're going to say, here, buddy, 
I, your guardians are in a meeting, so I need to keep you supervised. Um, so come up with funny command words. If I want my dog to lie down like this, I don't say lie down, I say crash. If I want my dog to go forward, I say charge. Uh, you know, coming up with funny command words can bring a little levity to the situation. The guardian's a little bit stressed out because of how rambunctious he has been. And you're being a little bit rambunctious right now. How about we give you a treat for just hanging out? We'll smash it and get you to work on it a little bit and stay here. Okay, so um, uh, because we have kids in the house, I'd like the kids to get involved in naming things. Now make sure the name is kind of somewhat appropriate. Don't say spaghetti for lay down. There's no meaning for that. But maybe say chill or crash or slide or something like that for lay down. We can see the connection. Uh, but if the kids are the ones that come up with the command words, that can really help them uh, engage with the dog a little bit better. So maybe just say, okay, we need to come up with a new name for this new dog bed. Um, I want each one of you to think of a name early today, and then at dinner, tell me mom and dad pick a name, and then mom and dad will decide which name we're going to use. And, and try to alternate so that both kids are getting to name the dog different things. But if the kids come over and you say, crash, the dog lays down, or Venice, the dog goes to the dog bed, their friends are like, wow, you said Venice, the dog went over there. You said crash, the dog lay down. They smile, they laugh. That levity can really be beneficial. Now, uh, what else, uh, what other rules do we have? Uh, not being allowed within seven feet of a human who's eating, not being allowed to be in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Also, the dogs eat, uh, dogs eat in the order of their rank. The leaders eat first, then followers eat after. So I'd like the guardians to get in the habit of feeding the dogs, uh, or feeding the dog, I should say, after they eat something first. Now, if they're gonna go out to eat and they're not gonna eat here, all they have to do is get a chip or a cracker, a piece of celery, something healthy, preferably, um, and then just eat it in a couple bites and then give the dog permission to eat the food. So the dog has to wait and see the human eat it first. Now, for him, I wanted to spend a little bit more time with the guardians had to run to a meeting, so um, uh, what I would recommend is just basically not putting the food bowl down while the human eats first. Then we put the food bowl down and he can use those escalating consequences to keep the dog away. So stand between the dog and the bowl and use the second and third consequence to move the dog away until the dog stops trying to violate and come close. Should give you about a five to seven foot boundary the dog's not allowed to come towards. Then the human leans against the counter, pulls out a piece of celery, eats it in five more bites. Then we invite the dog to come over, Snoopy, tap the bowl, and when he comes over and he takes his first bite, come up with a command word. So for two months, every time he takes his first bite, you're gonna say the name chow, feast, grub, comida, something like that. And so after a while, the dog hears the word when there's food in his mouth, so the word means to eat. And eventually you can tell your dog just feast, and then the dog goes and eats when it hears the command word. Now, although I'm talking about feeding the dog uh, in a normal way, because he's chewing on things, I would like the guardians to start feeding him out of a dog toy. I'm going to show you the dog toy in a second, but I also talk to the guardians about making sure he has appropriate toys. Now, I'd like to get a wire mesh, a wire mesh, not bamboo, because he'll, or he'll, he'll chew those things. Get wire mesh, a basket that's big enough to feed, hold about 20 toys. And I told the guardian she needs to get a couple bones. They're white, they're, they're, they're clean, they've been boiled. Um, and dogs chew on things when they're nervous, so we want to give the dog appropriate things to chew on, otherwise we're going to chew on our shoes, our furniture, and things like that. And for shoes, and anything he likes to chew, the guardians have done a good job of, of cleaning everything up, but make sure we don't leave shoes or temptation out for about a month while we're transitioning this. Now, um, for, the, uh, uh, for the toys, I'd like to have some bones, some deer antlers, some nylon bones. Now, don't get nylon bones that all look like a fake skeleton bone. Get like one that looks like a donut, one that looks like a dinosaur, one that looks like a forearm, there's one like a the chicken. They come in different flavors. So get us several of those. Uh, also get some squeaker toys, some rope toys. He has some plush toys, uh, which for a dog his size is, are okay. But the, and also another one that I really like is a water buffalo tusk. Now when you get that, make sure it's solid all the way around. If it's hollow like a horn, don't get it, he'll splinter it and it'll destroy it. But that will probably outlast the dog. It's a great, destroy, great toy. Now, um, we also, I mentioned the tree dispensing toy. The one that everybody knows of is the Kong. Kong looks like kind of like a, 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 what we think of as a beehive, uh, kind of a round pyramid with three uh, tapering, uh, looks like almost like a Christmas tree. Uh, the best reference here. Uh, but basically what you want to do is put one of the, the high value training treats in here that I'm going to leave for the guardians in their kitchen somewhere. Um, these are tricky trainers. They work really well because they have no preservatives. So make sure you burp all the air out of the bag and ziplock the bag. We want a high value training treat the dog's really going to respond to. You see for this? He wants to get away, but I can activate his nose and get him to come back to me. And yes, you can have that because you're doing a good job of staying with me. I know you want to get 
Um, so uh, tricky trainers, chicken liver, soft and chewy, the smell of the food is more important to dog than the taste. And so we want a really high value stinky treat that's gonna get his attention like I just showed you. Now for a con, what I do is I take one of the tricky trainers, put it in there, and I fill it up with peanut butter. And don't get the really good peanut butter, just Jif or Skippy, smooth, not chunky. And then let the dog lick on, uh, have it. Now fill it all the way up, you'll look at it and be like, there's no way the dog's gonna get all the peanut butter. Fill it all the way up, the tongues are super long. And this gives him something to do. And dogs, when they kill an animal, they don't eat the whole animal. Typically, they tear a hole in the side and they tear, pull little pieces of flesh out of it. Well, if we can uh, have one of those, it's a great way to distract the dog. And the dog has to work to get that peanut butter out before he can get the treat at the bottom. I know, buddy. It's, we're hanging there. We're almost done. Um, and this is a great way to distract. I started with regular peanut butter, just raw, uh, just room temperature. But eventually, once he gets into it, then I start freezing them. And I used to have a couple in my freezer. I got a dog with a, a food allergy now. But when I don't, I always have a, several of them in the freezer. So if a guest come over unexpectedly, I can pull one out, give it to the dog, and now the dog is occupied. But again, like I said, make sure you put the dog in a position to succeed. If we have a neighbor or somebody coming over, take him for a long walk, play a couple games of fetch, and really over-exercise him before they come over so you depleted his excess energy. Now, this is what I was talking about before, which is an omega treat ball. There's a hole here, and I can put my hand in it, finger in it, and it's got a sleeve, so you gotta roll it just right to get some kibble to come out. I would put kibble, uh, the first couple of times I would put some of the high value training treats that I have in here, um, and then some of this kibble. Just hold your hand like that, put the kibble in, and this way he's gotta nudge this thing just right to get it, the kibble to fall out, and then he gets to lick up a little bit off the floor. So now, instead of chewing the couch, the couch just pays out stuffing. You see he's already interested in this, just has one treat in it. Now, so he should be fed out of this thing for the next month to two, so that he really gets in the habit of eating out of treat dispensing toys, as opposed to uh, eating out of the bowl. Uh, yeah, a bowl is fine, but we want to give him more incentive to chew on appropriate toys and not the furniture and other things. And so this is a great way to do it. Now there are other treat dispensing toys. I have some that are spinners. You have to spin it just right. There's a pocket they can lick out of. There's one that looks like pyramids and different shapes and sizes. So uh, just make sure it's not too hard to begin with. This is one of my favorite ones because the dogs can pretty much figure this out. And it, like I said, it takes a little bit longer to go through meal time. So it takes longer for the dog to finish, which gives us another way to preoccupy him. Also he's earning his food, which will help boost his self-esteem and confidence. <laughs> he's got his head, nose right on the hole. Um, okay, now every time that all the food is gone, pick this up. After a while, a lot of dogs will tear it open to see why you're not continuing to pay me treats. So as soon as he's done, put it up somewhere. Only use this to feed him or the other ones if you get a couple others as well. And again, do that for one to two months to really get him interested in eating his toy, uh, chewing his toys. Now I also like to get, I talked about the basket. At the end of every day, the kids can help with this. Go and pick up all the dog toys, put them all in the basket, and then put the basket in an area where you can access but then half the fun for the dog is go in the basket and figure out which toy I want to play with now. Now one of the things I do is I take, I, have, I want the dog to have about 20 toys at any one given time. What I do is each day I pick up one toy, it's not this, not this one, but other toys, and I go have a box in the closet somewhere. I put it in the box, in the front of the box, and out of the back of the box, I grab another toy and I give that one, put back in, that one into the rotation. And the next day I grab another toy, put it in the front of the box, and grab another one box. So you really have about 40 to 60 toys, but you're rotating them in and out so the dog's more interested in playing with them. Just like kids, they get bored of playing with a toy after a certain amount of time. Um, okay, so um, those are uh, tips and tricks for chewing, which will really help. I also talked to the dog guardians about getting some edibles, and I don't mean California adult marijuana edibles, but like kneecaps, tracheas, chicken feet, duck feet, um, uh, tongues, uh, cow's ears, uh, there's a cod skin, uh, salmon skin, all those things are great things that are ingestible for the dog to eat, and that's a higher value item. I also like bully sticks. Make sure you get them from the natural dog company and get the odor-free bully sticks so they won't smell when he's eating them and they won't smell when he, after he's eating them. Um, all right, uh, let me see what else. Passive training. Every time, the guardians were really engaging with him. When I first came in, he climbed on top, and he really likes attention and contact, which is great. But if he climbs on top of a human, that can be an indication that he doesn't fully respect the human. So there's nothing wrong with dog being in your lap if you invite the dog out, but he was just doing it on his own, which I think is contributing to him being confused about his position. So what we do instead is when the dog jumps up on me, if I pet him and I'm telling him, yes, petting, up, petting me is a way of getting attention, and, or if he nudges me, then yeah, you can tell the human what to do when they do it. Well, that confuses him into thinking he's responsible for us. So instead, when he jumps up on me, instead of doing what he wants and petting him, give him a counter order. Tell him to sit. When, when you ever pet a dog, try to pet it under the chin if all things are equal. 
just never pet a dog on top of the head. You can scratch his butt elsewhere as well. Just never pat on top of the head. That creates a down nose orientation. Insecure dogs look down. We want our dogs to feel good, proud, and confident. That's why you put them under the chin to facilitate that nose up orientation. Um, so, and when you do that, say just the command word of sit. If he's already sitting and he's nudging or pawing at you, tell him to come and lay over, uh, sit over here or lay down. He has to do something to change his state to earn that affection. And then as soon as he changes his state, then you pet him and say sit or whatever it is. And you can pet him for as long as you want. But when he, eventually what will happen is he's going to come start sitting in front of you to prepay for attention. When he does that, make sure we do recognize and reward him for doing that. Otherwise, he can go back to jumping up or barking or whatever else it was. Petting with a purpose. Uh, if we see somebody petting in the house, petting without a purpose, we might say paycheck. That person says stop petting, tell a dog to sit, pet on his chin, and say I asked him to sit before he came in the room, you just didn't see it. Because a lot of times we won't remember to pet with a purpose, especially when we first started doing this, we'll just be petting without paying attention. And if somebody comes in and says paycheck, they're helping us remember. So don't argue with about it, just immediately stop petting, tell the dog to sit, it gives you another chance to practice sitting again. And like I said, he's going to start coming up and sitting in front of us and prepaying for attention. Make sure we do recognize that. I say tech, testify or reward when I see some, the dog walked up to somebody and they missed an opportunity to do it. Now, that leads me to passive training. Passive training is rewarding the dog when the dog voluntarily offers the behavior. They're not nudging me. But if the dog's over there and it walks up to me and doesn't jump up, I would reach over and put it and say, come. Because that's the end result that I'm looking for is the come. I, if I lure him, then I have to train him and lure him, and it's a lot more work. If you get in the habit of petting, the, recognizing the dog, and then we have parents in the house, this is exactly what parents do for kids. And it's no extra work for the, for the or I want you to remember, this is no extra work for we, you with, with the kids. Do you brush your teeth? Oh, go brush your teeth. We do that because we want the child to get into a habit of brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth? Yeah. Oh, good job, buddy. And we make a big deal out of it. Same sort of thing for him. Every time he comes to us and sits down as his way of asking for attention, make sure we do recognize and reward him. The more we do that, the more the dog will start to offer those desired actions and behaviors in order to get our attention. Now, instead of training our dog to misbehave, we've taught our dog to behave. Now, if he jumps on the furniture, we want to, uh, I like to do directional commands. So what I do is take a treat, touch the dog's snout with it, and then toss it on the floor if he's on the furniture. And when he gets down, I would say, uh, and he licks it up, I would say the word off. So I'm putting the word off in context. Getting on the floor means getting a treat. And they hear the word off, and if you do that enough, He's happy to leave or to get down. Now, I also like to do this with rooms. So we teach a dog to leave a room. So what you want to do is grab these high-value training treat, the chicken, chicken livers that I like. You can tear each one of these in half because these are a little bit too big. He's, you can give it to him, but he's going to get full quick. So I just make him last a little bit longer, cut him in half, and then go to a room and then touch his nose with the treat and toss the treat right outside the room. The dog runs out the room and gets it and licks it up. We would say the word out. Then he's going to come, he probably come back, touch his nose with it, and throw it again. Do that with every doorway and room in your house. And you can have the kids come with you and help you doing that, have them throw the treat. Don't throw it too far, just like two, two or three feet. All I want to do is help the dog practice leaving the room and assign the command word of out. And so I'm rewarded to leave the room, and I now have a clear understanding of the word, the command word that means to leave the room. This way, when we're in the kitchen, we ask the dog to leave, he's happy to do it because we've taught him how to behave in that scenario. So for that, I, every dog is unique in, uh, in terms of its intelligence and how interested in it and how good the treats are. So I would basically do this, uh, maybe have each kid do this uh, once a day. So we, and the, one of the adults just escorts one of the kids around the house to each room. Do that for a week. After a week, you'll be able to stay out of any room and the dog will gleefully run out of the room. And it makes it a lot easier for you. Um, okay, what else do we go over? Um, oh, we went over how the kids, how we can get the kids to do the right thing with the dog. We have a young child who sometimes puts his feet on the dog. He doesn't mean it. He's a little bit, bit rambunctious just because of the age. He's not doing it to abuse the dog, but things that the dog does not like. And anything a dog is doing that we pet him is what we're reinforcing, but anything that the dog does in our presence that we don't disagree with, the dog thinks we're giving two thumbs up to. That shoe fits the other foot as well. If the child is doing something with the dog wrong and we don't intercede for the dog, the, eventually the dog's going to start interceding for itself and nipping the child, which we really don't want. So. Uh, I've come up with a way for kids to earn candy by doing the proper thing. I explain to the kids that when we pet our dog, a lot of times that's how we say thank you. So instead of saying thank you and petting the dog before it does something, we ask the dog to sit before we want to pet it. And for petting with a purpose, we should still ask the dog to sit, even if it's not demanding attention, still ask the dog to sit before you pet it. And then once you ask it to sit, and it sits, you can pet it for eight hours after that. It just has to do something to change its state for you. Now, for the kids, what we do is we get a jug or a little coffee mug, and we do an arts and crafts day. Each kid gets to write their name on the mug and put a baseball or whatever they're 
in it, into. And then basically we explain to the kids every time uh, we, you want to, uh, every time you want to pet the dog, ask the dog to sit, and then pet it to say thank you for sitting afterwards. Then come and tell the human, uh, tell the parent, and then the parent takes an M and M or whatever the candy the kid likes and goes and put it in that kid's jaw. Um, and if the kid starts doing putting his paw feet on the dog or something that we don't like, we go over and say, oh, I have to take away an M and M for that. Would you like to earn this back? Kid tells the dog to sit. It sits. We put the M and M back in the jar so we don't really have to take it. If a, dog is, a kid does something really bad, we might actually say, look, I'm going to have to take away all the M&Ms. The idea is not to take away the M&Ms unless we have to, but that's sometimes you need to. Uh, but that should be very, very rare cases. Um, and the idea is at the end of every day, the kids go and get the M&Ms, they dump it on their plate, and they count up who had the most M&Ms. Whoever the most M&Ms maybe gets a special privilege, a special extra dessert, gets to have a friend over on the weekend, or whatever it is, creates some sort of a, uh, a harmony. And the kids get to eat the M&Ms, eat if they don't want to eat them during dessert, give them, because uh, uh, it's too late in the day, give them to them lunch the next day or whatever it is. But now the kids have motivation to have the dog do things, and the kids are going to do it like crazy to get more M&Ms. Now, don't use it for non-dog related things. Every time I've talked to a client that uses this and they make it, oh, you didn't make your bed, so you lose the M&Ms, and then the kids just stop doing it. So this is just to help them have a positive association with the kids. After a while, the kids are going to be practicing getting like 20, 30, 40, 50 M&Ms each a day. Now the dog is practicing 50 proper sits a day or comes or lays down or whatever it is. Now, if we go to the door and tell the dog to sit, he sits and we open the door, then that would also be rewarded. Um, you know, or, you know, there are other things we can do with the dog. Uh, but the more that we do this, the more the dog is going to see the children as authority figures that should be listened to and responded to. And after a while, the dog's just going to go sit in front of them and stop jumping up on them because that doesn't get attention. Now, if tell the kids if the dog jumps up, what they should do is just hold still, cross their arms across their chest, and look up and just hold still like a statue. Become boring. And if you do that, the dog eventually look and to do something else. Um, let me see what else. Um, I'm trying to think what else we went over. Um, uh, we went over a lot. Uh, we didn't go over as much as I wanted to. The video above goes over loose leash training. Remember not to narrate before you, if you're ready for walk, you're ready for walk, you're ready for walk, you walk, you walk, you walk. I see people do this all the time and get their dog in a crazy mood. When your dog is overexcited, it's in an unbalanced state of mind, it's not gonna think very clearly. So if your dog gets excited for the leash or for the walks, let me know and I can share a video with you and shows you how to teach your dog to be calm before the walk, but the dog's energy before the walk in the house is gonna dictate the energy they're gonna have with them on the walk. So make sure it's nice and calm and balanced. Now, a trick for this is to practice leashing your dog up and stopping the instant the dog starts to get excited. And the other, the additional tri trick for this is to do this at times when you don't plan on taking the dog for a walk. This helps desensitize them. Normally we have such a busy schedule, all right, I got 28 minutes, I can walk the dog, and I can still do this, make a phone call, and still get to my meeting. And then we go on the walk, the dog's all over the place, and we get frustrated. So instead what we want to do is we want to basically practice leashing the dog up so I was like, oh, this is another leash drill. And I remember you says always mean that we go for a walk. Now we just, oh, we're walking. And you almost catch them by surprise. But if you're doing this and the dog gets over excited, you put the leash up and then you go back to watch your TV program. The dog's like, oh, I messed it up. Now we're not going for a walk. Next time I'm going to be calmer. Now calm, like I said, is not happy when it comes to dogs. So when we come home, if the dog's excited and we pet it, we're going to make it a little bit more excited. So this is going to be hard, but maybe this is something for the older child who really gets him riled up when she comes home from school. So maybe we say for her, you know what, when you come in, if he's excited and you just ignore him and walk by, maybe you get an M&M for that initially. But the idea is we want to ignore the dog when it's excited, and as soon as it calms down, then we turn and start petting it. And as soon as it gets up and he's excited, we pull back and we go about our business. We don't say no. We're not micromanaging the dog. We're just telling the dog, when you do what I want, good things happen. And when you do things that I don't like, then I lose all interest in petting. And after enough repetition of light switch on, light switch off, the dog will start calm, being calm when you come home and sitting down because that's the only way it gets your attention. Now, I also went through the escalating consequences to disagree with unlearned actions and behaviors with the guardians. Um, I really like to use those as little as possible. I mean, we, there are times where it's appropriate to say no and to correct a dog, but I find a lot of people don't teach the dog how to behave. And I'm gonna give you a little, uh, just a little cheat about what I do, how I help dogs fix, how I fix dog problems. First thing I do is I, I, I ask, has the dog been taught how to behave? No. Let's say the dog's excited at the door. Well, the door is an excited time. People are coming in and the dog thinks he's in, job, in, in charge of security because he doesn't have any rules. Well, the additional rules are going to help reduce that. 
But if we go to the door and he's in front of us, for dogs, whoever's in front is perceived to be the leader. So if he's already in front of me and I go to open the door, then he looks at me as assisting him. So what I would do first is I walk towards the door, and when the dog's already there, I put my butt to the door, and I walk directly at the dog using the third escalating consequence, and I walk him back until he's about 10 feet away from the door. If he tries to go around me, then I step to the side. Don't let him outmaneuver you. Sometimes people have to put some things in the, in the boundary uh, to kind of make a choke point so the dog can't run around you, negate his athletic ability. So remember, your authority goes whatever direction you're facing. So I'm going to march towards the dog until he gets behind the 10-foot line. I'm going to stop at that point. And then what I'm going to do is take one step backwards, left foot, right foot, and I'm going to pause for a quarter of a second. The dog starts to come forward. I'm going to march rapidly right back at the dog to say that's not what I wanted. And I'm going to keep doing this back and forth motion until the dog stays behind the line. Then I can take another step backwards, and I pause about a quarter second between each step backwards. Eventually, I get all the way to the door. Now, if I turn to face the door, now my authority is pointing away from the dog. So when you're walking back away from the dog, walk backwards, so you're facing the dog this way, and the door would be behind me. Then I would reach up, and I would click the deadbolt. Now, the sound of the deadbolt precedes the door opening, so that's going to cause the dog to rush the door. So, but we're facing it. So the very first step it starts taking, off, it's taking towards the door, we're going to hiss and stop we're doing a rush towards the dog. Once it gets across the line, we stop. So we don't have to go all the way to the line, just until the dog gets back across the line. Then we're going to walk backwards very measurably until we get back to the right spot. And then we're going to click the deadbolt and do it as noisily as possible. You're teaching the dog, this is the behavior I want at this stage, step of answering the door, staying behind the line. Once the dog can handle that step, only then do I move to the next step. And then I jiggle the handle. And that's again causing the dog to come up and I rush back and forth until the dog stays behind the line when he hears that sound. Then I open it a crack. Then I open it all the way. And so I'm teaching the dog. And what I do is basically I reverse engineer the activity, break it down into individual steps, help the dog practice the first step over and over and over again in the easiest capacity possible until it knows how to do it and does it consistently. Only then do I go to a second step and repeat the process there. I do that for all the individual steps. Now, when we have a real guest at our door, we're distracted. We want the guest to come in. We don't want to be rude hosts. And we're, so we're thinking about a whole bunch of other things. So how can we recreate this? Well, maybe we have one of the guardians call or text the other guardian. I'm coming home, let's do the door exercise. Great. So now the guardian sits here, instead of being caught by surprise when somebody comes to the door, which is normally what happens, we, and let's say we're doing some finger painting. Well, instead of doing finger painting, we wipe, wipe our hands clean. We, uh, you know, if we're doing 10 other things and we get distracted, we have to turn the stove down and put the dog outside or, you know, to get the kids going here and get off the phone and, and wash my hands. And we're rushing, and the dog's like, man, she never moves this fast. Why is she moving this fast? Oh, there's somebody at the door. The person at the door is disturbing the peace. I'm going to have to really bark at them and let them know that I'm not happy with what they're doing. So instead, when we call or text ahead of time, we're ready for it. We go to the door. We can break it down step by step. And we know it's our spouse on the other side or a friend or whoever it is. So we don't have to rush. We take away that pressure. And we help the dog practice the behavior we want before we actually open the door. Then after we practice that enough, then the dog knows how we want it to behave in that activity. Then we have a real guest, the dog just walks up to the 10-foot line, stops and turns around and we're like, are you going to answer that or what? You've taught your dog how to behave. So that's really a microcosm. So if the dog misbehaves in a lot of situations, I want you to look at yourself, how can I recreate that situation and help the dog practice it? And you want the dog to stumble across the step itself. So we take away all the opportunities and when the dog does the right thing, we only give you a couple opportunities. So um, let me see, he likes, well, Trying to think of a good analogy, and I can't right now. But uh, again, break it down in individual steps and recreate the situation. Now, I also like to help the dog practice. Now, we talked a little bit about the kids. There's two kids. They like to have snacks. And the dog likes to steal stuff out of their hands. And the mom is usually giving them a snack, and the mom's doing something else. Because, you know, we're busy. Well, what we can do instead is have mom give them the snacks, and then have one of the rules to be the dog's not allowed to be in this little L in between the table and the couch. And so the kids come and sit here and eat their snack, and mom can practice using the escalating consequences to enforce the boundary that the dog is not allowed to come in this area when the kids are eating. After about a week of this, the dog will just stay outside the area on its own because as soon as it crosses the threshold, mom is right there, like white on rice. And after a while, mom can be a little farther away, a little farther away, and the dog now knows how to behave in that activity. I also do this for like the kitchen or for when we're eating. When we're eating, we're thinking about eating our food. And, not, and when the dog gets away, so we finish and then we get up and we move away, well, then we might miss that three second window. So what I do instead is I'm gonna eat, what I do is I do a practice eating session. Set the table like you normally would. Get a piece of roast beef, microwave it about 30 seconds so it has a strong smell. 
Then basically what I would do is go to the dinner table, and again, the dog's not allowed to come, either come into the room or within seven feet. So we practice putting that on each people's person's plate, we cut it up and pretend like we're eating, we're practicing. And we're not actually planning on eating the roast beef, so the dog violates perimeter. Whoever's sitting here can stand up and turn and face and march at the dog and teach the dog, when we're eating and you smell food at the table, you're not allowed to be in the room or within seven feet of the table. It's nice if you can have a line of delineation. A lot of times we put down carpet around the tables or maybe the doorway to the room, the dog's not allowed to cross that threshold. Now, once the dog sits or lies down past that, then we can put the roast beef up and then do our actual meal. We help the dog do a practice or a dry run. Now it knows how to behave. And now we do our actual meal where we're focused on the meal. The dog has already practiced and warmed up and knows what to do. I do the same thing for the kitchen. I might maybe microwave, I would say bacon, but that wouldn't be appropriate here. But something, you know, a lunch, a meat of some sort that's going to have a strong aroma that's going to attract the dog's attention. We want a dog to set up scenarios, there's no entrapment, we'll husk for dogs. So we want to set the dog up when we have time to practice. Because as a family, we're busy doing other things and we're trying to teach the dog in the moment is the worst possible place to do that. Now, uh, because the dog is having accidents in the house, I don't think that he's been properly potty, properly potty trained. Now, when I was a child, if I did something wrong, I would lose some privileges. Like if I borrow my dad's car and I bring it back with an empty tank of gas and a flat tire, he's probably not gonna let me borrow it again uh, for a while. And I have to prove through other behaviors that I'm good, that I'm matured, and then he might give me an opportunity to do it later. And so for the dog, he, right now he has full access to the whole house. And he's not to be trusted. He's peeing on the kids' stuff, on the furniture, all over the place. And again, I don't think he, he's not doing it on purpose. So it's important to understand that he's not doing this to piss us off. He's doing it because he doesn't know any better. Now, I should have a video linked above with tips on potty training. If I don't, message me and I'll add it in there. Um, but I would first assign a command word, and then I would take him out to the place that we want him to pee on a leash for a week every time he goes outside, which means we're going to close the doors in the house. Eventually, uh, after a week, uh, and every time he pees, we're going to say business or whatever the word is that means potty within three seconds of him starting. No, and we're gonna stay, and he's gonna be on a leash. Even though it's a fenced-in yard, we want him to pee in a certain area. And then after a week or two weeks of doing that, we're gonna bring him out to that same area, off leash, and have a treat with us. If he pees in that in that circular area where we were before with the leash, he gets five treats. And say business, if that's a word, or potty or whatever it is, each time the treat goes his mouth. So in one business, 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 business. We want the dog going, hold on a second. What did I just do to get all of these amazing treats? And if he pees anywhere else in the yard, he gets one treat because we want him to pee in the yard, not on the deck or in the house. And after a while, if we do this enough, the dog will be like, I'm not gonna waste my urine inside. This is valuable stuff that earns me delicious treats if I do it in a certain area outside. Uh, being able to teach the dog to a specific area can really be beneficial, especially when you have kids who the kids aren't walking through stuff. It takes time and practice. Now, a lot of people, when they're going through the practice, they look at it and it's like, I don't have time to do this every time. He's a dog, you should learn to do it. We just have the wrong expectations. You're not gonna do this forever. Do this for maybe one, two, three weeks. After three weeks, you have a lifetime of the dog going and potting where you want. That's amazing. But you have to put in the time and effort. Dogs are resilient creatures and they really do wanna please us. We just need to put them in scenarios where we're gonna reward them when they do the right thing, do it over and over again. Eventually, we can create a new behavior pattern and the dog just gets in the habit of doing that. So in the short term, what I would do, and it's a pain in the butt, but I would get some baby gates and start with one room access. And again, if he's in this room, we should have the X pads up on the, uh, on the uh, couch so the dog can't get on the couch and it has a dog bed in there. And so we limit him to one room. So if he has an accident, it's contained in one room. And we keep on practicing a positive uh, potty train until eventually he doesn't want to potty and he wants to whimper to go outside. That's his same way of saying, I'm not gonna do it inside, let me out, I gotta do my business. Once we get to the point where he's potty trained, he can say business or whatever the word is, and he perks up and jumps around, then you know that he knows the word. If you want, you can teach him to ring a bell for the door, but we're in Southern California, the door is usually open. The dogs, I think, want them to go in and to be able to go in and out. Now, once he's potty trained, we'll allow him to have more access to the house, but at first, maybe it's just access to this room, and if he, after a week of him not having access in this room, maybe we open up the baby gate, now he has this room in the hallway in this room, in the, the, the hallway, and the next room. So we're gradually gonna ration out more and more access as he proves to be trustworthy. And after a while, we don't have to worry about the potty in the house. Now, uh, because uh, we have a sliding door, the guardian might want to consider doing a dog door 
Dog groomers are amazing once your dog's potty trained because he just lets himself in and out to do his business. He can run outside and play fetch and all that fun stuff. There is a dog door that you can get for a sliding door. It's just an insert. It makes your door a little bit narrower, but it's got the built-in dog door and you don't have to bust it through a wall. Um, now, the guardians may want to consider getting an eye fetch because that allows the dog to play fetch by himself. And so, uh, again, practice the fetch like I described earlier in this video first and message me if you have any questions or problems. Uh, last thing is I always like to give my dog a naughty dog name. My dog's name is Quest, my youngest dog. When he's doing something I don't like, I call him Rufus. My name is David William. If my mom ever said David William, I was not getting chocolate cake. I was in trouble. Well, if we say the dog's name, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. After a while, sometimes they don't come as quickly. So if I come up with a name that you, whatever it is, a short name, a unique name that you can use when he's doing the wrong thing. If I say Quest sit and he doesn't sit, I say Rufus, he sits down. He knows he's about to get in trouble. And don't punish your dog, no spanking your dog, or things along those lines. Dogs do not learn through those methods. What we want to do, like I said, is recreate situations, help them practice in the easiest capacity possible, then start adding back in the real world elements until we work our way back up to a real world situation. The dog knows it behaves perfectly because we've taught it how to behave throughout. Okay, well this is Snoopy who is now uh, calmed down, is nice and relaxed, and almost asleep, and I'm just waking up. So he doesn't even want to take the treat. He's uh, so comfortable. Snoopy, I had a lot of fun. Oh, last thing. He's got, um, if you can see in his eyes in this video, um, he's got, it looks like uh, ovals around his eyes. Um, I just saw this with a lab for the first time uh, years ago. There's a mite that will eat the skin and the fur around the dog's eyes. And it's itchy and it's very annoying for the dogs. And the gardens have noticed it gets better and worse. So it probably has some of those mites. So I would talk to your vet about that and get some uh, pills to help eradicate that. Or I can't remember if it's drops. I can't remember my dogs have never had this, but it's, I'm pretty sure he has this uh, scenario. So it's uh, I don't know what, I can't remember what it's called, but I know it's a mite and it specifically eats the fur uh, around the eyes. And you can see in his eyes, he's got rings around the eyes. All right, Snoop, I had a lot of fun with you today, buddy. He's like, whatever, man. I want to go over there and see what the voices are outside, but you won't let me explore. This is Snoopy, and these are uh, this is Snoopy's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you need it, right, Snoop? It's like, see ya.